Bonjour, so this is uh, our last tag for today. Uh, I'm happy to reintroduce Benjamin Doyon, who will uh, give his seminar today, not his uh, lecture. And uh, he'll tell us about spin chains and this very strong claim that in every finite range quantum spin chain, linearized Euler hydrodynamic equations hold. Thank you. Yes, indeed, this is a very bold claim. And if you look at that, you see this is completely impossible and it can be true. So of course, I have uh, there are many words in there, and one has to define these words appropriately, particularly what are the linear linearized Euler hydrodynamic equations? What, what are these things? So, uh, but I mean, the idea here is to say, so this is kind of combining a bit of a physics, basic physics, not, not so complicated physics, but kind of nice about hydrodynamics and mathematics. So trying to get something that is rigorous. And usually when you get things that are rigorous, I mean, it is hard to find new physics when you do rigorous mathematics. Um, and indeed, there, there is not a lot of new physics in it, but uh, there is some nice result, which is that, you know, something you can get by doing rigorous that you know where that physics applies. And here, it turns out that the Euler scale appears to be extremely general and very applicable very widely. And uh, here, applicable to every finite range quantum spin chain. I should add uh, maybe uh, the, the two, well, one more thing. Translation invariant finite range quantum spin chain. Maybe with this order, it would still hold. No, I think that can be generalized. But anyway, here translation invariant finite range quantum spin chain. So, for instance, Heisenberg spin chain. Okay, so clean. So that's the idea now. So uh, the general principle, well, general ideas behind that is the thing of emergence. So you have a mini, a mini body microscopic system with a dynamic, something that is hard to understand and to study, you know, at large scales in space and time. For instance, quantum chains or particles interacting or, or quantum field is, of course, a lot of research going into understanding what happens at large scales. Okay? So the problem of emergence, what are the emergent laws at large scale? And the emergent dynamics of many body systems usually is hydrodynamics. So, uh, so hydrodynamics, what is this? What are, these are two basic equations that you find in, in textbooks or maybe some one dimensional reduction of what you would find in textbook. The first one is conservation of mass. If you have particles moving around, there'll be mass conservation. The second one is conservation of momentum, the standard Euler equation of hydrodynamics. And these equations correctly describe where P or rho is a pressure, some function that depends, you know, the, the equation of state that depends on the model. So this equation describes quite a lot of systems, but of course not every system. And I will not claim, I, I am not claiming that these are the right equations for every quantum finite range quantum spin chain. They are not, right? But something different, something of the same scale and, and of the same type will work. And that's, that's the idea. Now, so this, uh, so that idea came from I, my, our study of uh, integrable systems where you, you have earlier hydrodynamic equations, which are not these equations, which are more complicated than that, which involve all the conserved quantities. So you have infinitely many earlier hydrodynamic equations that you have to put together. So, so you know, when you, have, when you think about earlier hydro, you have to think about, well, what are the conserved quantities of your models? And this is, of course, model dependent. Depend. But once you've put them out, maybe then what results, uh, the, the resulting equations, maybe they are correct. And the claim is that there is a notion of extensive conserved quantity, a general notion that applies to every short range quantum spin chain and define what an extensive conserved quantity is. And then you can say, well, this is a space and that is complete. And if you have a chain, well, that's the space. And then once you have that space, you can write equations of the type Euler with these conserved quantities as being the emergent degrees of freedom. So you can define what these conserved quantities are formally, and then you derive the equation of Euler type, you know, where these conserved quantities are the emergent degrees of freedom. And that will work for every quantum spin chain. Now the problem is what are these conserved quantities? And that depends on the model. So that's why it's not always these equations. It's these or, or the equation of generalized hydrodynamics for integrable system or, so, or something else. Okay. So that's what uh, I want to say. So, you know, what are, you know, there's some kind of general form of Euler hydrodynamics. Uh, and somehow that general form with, uh, you know, generally defined cost of quantities has a chance of holding more generally. And turns out for every short range chains, it holds. Okay. So, uh, so this also goes into the, the, the idea of uh, proving things in, in mathematically, proving physical principles mathematically, which is, a uh, very difficult problem, but one I think one of the most important questions of the mathematical physics is that proving hydrodynamic and, and other kind of emergent phenomena uh, rigorously. It's, it's very difficult, right? And this is, I think, some of the most important problems. Uh, there aren't so many uh, results about proving emergence. I think some of the uh, recent results by uh, Smirnoff and others on some of the evolution and all that 
which gave proof of emergence of CFT in the easing model. Now, easing model for the physicists is just completely trivial, right? It's been done for a long time ago. But for the mathematician, it is not, right? And then the CFT or very structural CFT was proven recently, it's emergent structure. And that lead, led to field middle. Well, I'm not claiming my result will lead to field middle. That's not the point. But you know, there's something that, yeah. The 2D, 2D, I think, statistical model, yes. Indeed, indeed, yeah. So that yeah, you do like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we kind of know, right? But uh, yeah, so somehow they, for in every in every domain, and you know, a, so one can prove. Okay, so this is an example where you don't get to the new physics, but yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it is exact. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. I, I agree, I agree, I agree. So it's all exact. You can, in principle, I agree with you. You can, in principle, put the little uh, commas and and whatever dots and blah, 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 to make it rigorous. Uh, but but then if you want to do that in an arbitrary domain and all that, then you, uh, you have to be a bit more careful. And it's what you do. <laughs> you take the exact solution and you cannot do that. But right? you use the, the preferment structure. And you can just do for the easy model naturally because otherwise you don't have the preferment structure. So this is the only model where there's been rigorous results. Maybe percolation, there are some results. But again, percolation is another simple thing. Okay, so yeah, so, uh, so this is one of these things. Now, for, for Hadoop Dynamics, there, there are not so many results, actually. I mean, for earlier Hadoop Dynamics, okay? Not, not necessarily the equation that I wrote, but also this equation or whatever earlier scale Hadoop Dynamics, which I will define a bit more precisely, but I talked a bit in my lectures, okay? There are not so many results, but so here are the, the results that I know of. I mean, there's some nice results by, by uh, Boldigrini, Dobushin, and Sukov in 1983. And it's for a simple model called the hard rod gas, it's like the hard sphere, but in 1D, okay? So the rod that hit each other is very simple. Like they're free, except the, the hit, when they hit each other, extend the moment time, they have a finite mass. Okay? Then you can prove rigorously that this gas satisfies a certain type of Euler scale equation, which, which is a special case of the generalized Hadoop dynamics that I talked about quickly in the class, uh, in, the, in, the, in the lectures. But uh, so it's a very simple case, actually. And it's, it's completely trivial to derive, well, not trivial, but simple to derive physically. But then to prove, okay, so you can prove that. So there's some earlier Hadoop equation coming out. Uh, earlier equation, you can prove from certain assumptions on ergodicity, so not complete. So you have to check ergodicity so you can prove in, uh, in the different ways by making assumptions. For cellular automata, there are some proofs, not exactly over the equation. Well, actually, yeah, maybe over the equations in some simple cellular automata. And recently there's been proofs, proofs, proof, proofs of this equation, this equation, essentially, for the random mass harmonic chains, and they use the randomness very importantly, and they use a, actually some kind of a, a localization property because of randomness. And then you can prove this uh, earlier equation, which is quite, quite interesting, but random mass uh, harmonic chain, otherwise harmonic, so of course free, right? Uh, so yes, uh, okay, so these are kind of results uh, that they are. Now, um, Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is not actually something simpler even than that, I'll do more general, okay? So I'm talking about my quantum system, so not, not a classical particle, my quantum system, and even quantum chains. And so, so you would imagine you have other when you have particles moving around and all that, but in fact, even if you have chains flipping around, you can have earlier Hadoop dynamics coming out, okay? It may be that your earlier scale is trivial, so maybe the earlier Hadoop equation is trivial, but maybe that is non-trivial, so but... But there is some equation you can write, uh, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, uh, of earlier time. Okay. But what I'm going to uh, study are not really directly these earlier Hadoop equations, but something a bit simpler, which is the linearized earlier Hadoop dynamics. And we had a talk today uh, about that uh, linearized version of Hadoop dynamic equation. It's very useful. You can do all kinds of things. So the linearized version of Hadoop dynamic equation allows you to study correlation or response. In this case, what I'm going to be studying is these correlation functions, two-point function, A, B in some state, and doing linearized earlier around that state. So kind of perturbate with the state. And say, okay, so that's the idea. So, uh, but I mean, forget about perturbation of the state. This is a two-point function of two local observables, say uh, sigma z, sigma a, sigma z, sigma z, say in the x, x, uh, z spin chain, or, or Say, or, or something more complicated, right? Sigma x, sigma y at some point, and then sigma x, sigma y at some other point, or whatever. So any two like a product of spins around some sites at two different space-time points. So one is here and the other is there, like in space-time, right? 
and you take the space time to be very big so you go in the the hyperbolic scaling where both space and time scale simultaneously with fixed ratio okay so this is the hyperbolic scaling and that's supposed to be where earlier hydrodynamics emerges and you look at cur connected correlation functions subtracting the average okay so that's the idea what is the large large space time limit of these two point functions okay so um that so the 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 main physical idea is actually very well known and and rather well studied in, in various contexts uh and it can be written quite generally i mean recently we we understood people understood how to write this generally thanks to the study of an integrable system but the principle was pretty well known for a long time ago it's something called the boseman gibbs principle actually boseman gibbs is more general but that's a small version of it and what it says is that you can reduce number of degrees of freedom at large space time by in the following way this is the, the physical picture it's very simple so the two-point function you can imagine that you have at space time zero zero you put an observable you put an observable in systems like you hit with a hammer or something with the, you know the hammer the, your choice of hammer is your choice of observable kind of how you hit and all that okay so the system kind of uh, disturbed a little bit there the disturbance start moving around a lot of things happen actually around there but at large time what remains is just a little wave it's like you know you have this lake very you know nothing you move and then you put your finger there you move the molecules there a lot a lot happens but at large time in large space time just some nice little wave coming out okay so there are some certain waves that come out that propagate so you project a onto some wave you calculate the two-point function of these waves some observable that represent the waves right and then you project back onto the 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 probe this other operator at xt later on in, in time at some other point in space and supposedly you're going to have strong correlation if this other observable is along the trajectories of these waves, essentially, right? So this is the idea. Is kind of like how to, yeah. So it kind of uh, you can you can imagine. So you can insert an operator like that by doing a small perturbation of the state. So local quench, yes, indeed, yeah. So like infinitesimal local quench, infinitesimal because it's a just a, a correlation function of local observable at that point. Um, in fact, maybe I could even think about like uh, not infinitesimal, and this could probably the theory would work, but okay, I have to think about it. But think about infinitesimal local quench, yes, yes. So it's really like the simplest possible situation, you know, Jewish, yeah. Okay, other questions. So this is the situation, and that, that's the physics of it. Um, now, uh, um, uh, so this is, okay, so this is one principle that I want to get to. So the Boseman Gibbs principle, okay. Now, these are words, but one can put some equations to that, I guess. So this is, but the words pretty clear. You project, project. Well, well, actually, if you project, you have to have a, a space, right? The vector space and the projector. So some inner products. You know, if you have orthogonal projection, so you have to have some mathematical structure, right? And once you have this, you use that to project, and then you you construct this. Okay. And and then the the other thing is uh, so this. So so this maps a two point function of arbitrary arbitrary observable to two point function of these uh, kind of uh, slowly moving waves or modes and by the way these uh, in the standard theory should be identified with the densities of conserved quantities right so density of energy your momentum and all that that's that's what the people understand should go there right project on the density of conserved quantities okay and then these themselves satisfy an equation and that's the equation that we said in the talk in the previous talk today the linear linearized earlier equation uh which is you know you know which describe the space type propagation of the conserved modes right so the conserved densities so what it says is that uh well you know you start this the usual argument right the physical argument you start with your earlier equation the earlier equation it says that your average density and average currents you can calculate them in, in space time and locally they always take values in in uh well locally your system thermalize or reaches the maximum entropy with constraint of the conserved quantities. And then these QIs and JIs are just average of the density and currents within this locally thermalized state. So this, that's kind of the thing that I have explained in the, in the, in the lecture. So, um, so this has five this continuity equation. You, uh, the set of averages of conserved densities characterizes the local state. The local state is some Gibbs-like distribution like that, okay? So uh, the the currents then are function of these uh, the average currents are function of the average density. So you can do small perturbation around that state, and so the the small perturbation propagates according to a linearized equation like like we saw in the morning. 
where the linearized equation just involved the variation of the average currents with respect to the average densities. It's, it's purely just you know, write this for averages and do a small you know, delta plus delta Q in there and get a linearized equation. And then the physical idea is that the small propagation of, of a perturbation actually represents what happens to correlator. So you write the same equation, but for correlation function. And that's your, your, your correlation function propagation equation. Okay? What's involved in there is this matrix, so the flux Jacobian I introduced in the lecture, which is the derivative of the average currents with respect to the average densities, both in the state of the Gibbs, ty Gibbs type seen as being you know, function of the average density. The average density sticks out the betas, out the, the adverse temperatures. And then you have, then you can do the derivative. Okay. So that's the, the basic thing. And so this is the equation that we would like to prove. So this equation and then the projection principle. Okay, so questions on. Oh, okay, so this is a general principle. You don't need to have a particle dynamics, Boltzmann equation and all that. This is just, you know, you have Gibbs states, you have average densities and currents, you write an equation for correlation function. It should work quite generally. And then you want to study that in quantum spin chain. Now, so what it says, this principle, it says that, uh, well, you, it, it's, if you look at this matrix, this matrix has a spectrum eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues have the meaning of the velocities at which these waves propagate. You can see that by diagonalizing that, that linear, linear equation. Okay? So, all right, so the spectrum is where you have non trivial uh, uh, correlation. And in fact, physically, what it means is that this is where you're going to have power law decay of correlation. While away from that, you would expect exponential decay. Now, the, so I'm not going to prove that level of, of uh, detail because the power law decay depends on many things, not just the Euler scale. If it's diffusive, it was, it's a root of T. The super, super diffusive is something else. That's, it's, it's interesting, but it's, a, it's much more complicated and much less universal, right? But still, you know, that's, that's the physical meaning. Okay, okay so, um, so the questions they rigorously formulate what is a set of ballistic waves? What are these QIs? So conserved quantities, okay, what are conserved quantities? You know? And then formulate the, 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 the hydro, hydrodynamic projection principle or Boltzmann Gibbs principle, and then prove uh, linearized equation and, and uh, Boltzmann Gibbs formula. Okay, so, uh, so, and what I'm claiming, and I proved in this paper, supposedly, unless there's a mistake, I don't know, what I'm claiming is that the, this, these, all these principles hold in every short range homogeneous quantum spin chain. So short range means that Hamiltonian is a, is a, you know, it's a sum over all sides, homogeneous of some Hamiltonian density, something. And that's Hamiltonian density just involves a finite number of sides. And the local spin is, a, is finite, spin half, spin one, spin two, whatever, but finite, like C, Cn locally, okay? So that's, that's the setup, okay? Okay, is it clear? No, so no, indeed, indeed, I, I it's, it's uh, like uh, William was saying, in the end, there's very little left of, of what I wanted to prove. No, I cannot prove that it's power law decay. Uh, I can prove, yeah, so somehow uh, you prove something, like you prove an integrated version, you kind of Fourier transform in all that, and you prove something that has to do with Fourier transform. How, how it is written exactly with power law decay, is not completely clear. There's a bit of kind of Fourier transform analysis to do, so it's not completely clear. So I cannot prove that. Uh, neither, you know, exponential decay, uh, it's, it's, it's just very difficult that I can prove something weaker than that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> thank you for this one. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, so let's see. So first of all, um, yeah, so what I want to say, so yeah, so these, the, the set of uh, conserved charges, um, anyway, I'm not sure what I said it already. I think so. Set of conserved charges. So uh, usually, when you have a quantum spin chain which is uh, you know, not integrable, a typical quantum spin chain that's not integrable, uh, typically what you expect is that there's a single conserved charge, which is just the energy, the Hamiltonian, and there's nothing else in a quantum spin chain. Okay? You would expect that. So you would expect a complete trivial orbital hydrodynamics. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's not clear, in fact. If really in, in typical quantum chain, there is a single one, there might be more, I'm not completely clear. So it's not clear. So, and, and my results don't really address that, okay? But what they address is, you know, that space of conserved charge is that. So maybe now we, you know, we have to look at a bit more precisely in the, in the quantum chain, what are the possibilities, right? Uh, but certainly in integrable systems, there are infinitely many. And so then you have non-trivial dynamics. And so somehow the results are fully applicable, you know, certainly. 
in integrable systems, so non trivial and applicable integrable systems. Uh, now, uh, proving, of course, you know, what are these kinds of charges difficult and all that, but okay, so it's a separate problem. So what I, so what I want to see here is really that there are things that are difficult, there are things that are less difficult, so let me prove the things that are generic and, and kind of less difficult and, and you know, that apply to every system and keep the tricky stuff, like what are the degrees of freedom, what are the kinds of charges to uh, further future research or something, right? So what are the, the full set of conceptuages is a difficult problem. Is the model integrable or not? This is a difficult problem. Right, so, um, so here is the typical model, right? It has a bit chain uh, representative of this family of model. Uh, and what kind of states I'm looking into? Well, here are the state thermal states, and this is kind of a mathematical formulation, right? So it's important to realize that if you have an infinite, uh, infinite sized chain, then there is no such thing as a, as a density matrix, right? So, the density matrix is a finite size. Right? Infinite size and density matrix is, blows up. It's infinite dimensional matrix. And uh, what kind of infinite dimensional matrix is not so clear. In fact, that's not the information that you want. What you want is the average of local observables. This is just very, a very restricted you know, set of information or bit of information from, from the original thing. You don't care about what happened very far. Maybe there's a boundary. You don't care about the boundary, all that stuff, like bulk, right? Okay, so what you do, well, you do this, this trace in finite, finite size, this is your finite size Hamiltonian, for instance, you take the limit of large L, but not of the density matrix, but of averages. And this is the, these are the, the main objects, okay? So, in the, uh, so, so they, they should be seen, these averages should be seen as linear functional on a set of observable. And that's a very powerful way of looking at that. So observable is some set, some vector space, actually. And then you have functional that map this to numbers, averages, and this is your state, that's it, okay. Now, there are many results for these fine temperature states from very old results, and now there's, there's even more results, but at least for, for quantum chains, you know, there's very old results. One thing is that this state, this linear functional, is positive, is bounded, has all nice properties that you would like to have for linear functionals can be proven. And uh, this is this whole on the algebra of finitely supported observables, so any, you know, observable that is supported on finite number of sites, you get, an, you get a finite answer, and then the answer has all the nice properties of, of a state, in particular, the average of a positive operator is a positive number and all that, okay? And uh, these observable, in fact, can be uh, extended to something called a C-star algebra under the, the matrix norm, uh, and the state is well-defined on the C-star algebra. So you don't necessarily have to consider just observable and finite number of sites. You can consider infinitely large observables as long as the norm stays finite, and you can imagine such observables. And then the state is well defined on this. And then you have a complete set of observables. It's kind of useful to, to look at this complete set somehow. So then there's a lot of results about this, right? The C star algebra, it becomes operator algebra. So this is mathematics, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, you see, it's a good question, right? So, so I mean, the boundary condition here, there's a boundary, right? And I take L to infinity. So I could take F, F, F three. Yeah, yeah, here, exactly, exactly. And here I've chosen a boundary condition, like a trivial one open. I could have chosen a uh, periodic and all that. Now, yes, this, yeah, this breaks translation variance, but the limit, according, this is also part of hierarchy's result, the limit is translation variance. It, it is recovered and independent of the boundary condition. For finite range, quantum spin chain has finite temperature because there's no uh, kind of a phase, uh, phase transition and, and symmetry breaking in finite temperature, non-zero non temperature then there's no influence of the boundary. Every finite range quantum chain with non-zero temperature, just because it's too, very simple. Of course, if it's, if it's two-dimensional, not one-dimensional, then it's not true anymore, because you could have a uh, phase transition, so you could have a situation where the boundary influences the state in the bulk, like, because, because you, know, you can have two states, you know, spin up or spin down, and all that, you put your spin up, that's a state, your spin down, that's another state, right? But it doesn't happen in 1D. If, if I were at temperature zero, then it could happen as well, but temperature non zero doesn't happen. So it's very simple. Now, uh, so it's an example, but for the, for the theorems now, that somehow you don't necessarily need that as long as your state has all the nice properties, no matter where it comes from, but this is kind of one way of work. So it's, uh, yeah, relatively simple, okay. Um, so homogeneous, yeah, so as part of this result, it is homogeneous and stationary, so space, time, transition invariant, depending on the boundary, okay. Uh, so, you know, in mathematics, one th think about homogeneity as a, you know, translation is an operator that acts on, on the observables and, and time evolution is also an operator that acts on the observable. 
and maps the C star algebra to the C star algebra. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, a, you know, you have your observable. And it's, it's kind of important to think about C star algebra because if you do time evolution of, of, a, of a, an observable on two spins, you do the time evolution. For any finite time, the result is not supported on a finite number of spins. Never. Because you do e to the i h t, right? There's an h there. And if you expand in, in power, you have, to, you have infinitely many commutators to take. And that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So actually, for any finite time, you have something supported on the whole chain, not on a few sides. Nevertheless, it has finite norm. So it's still fine from the point of view of norm, right? That's why it's, it's useful to kind of extend a bit from the finitely supported operator to go this beyond, you just, just to have time evolution, okay? But, it's, but okay, if you don't, so this is kind of the, the mathematical details and okay, this, you have to think about that when you do the rigorous stuff, okay? And, and the other thing, the very important thing is that this, this state is exponentially clustering in space. So if you look at uh, the operators ever, uh, that are as separate uh, locations in space, then the correlation, calling the correlation function will decay exponentially. So this is, you know, no phase transition, okay, at fine temperature, everything decays exponentially. So these are theorems for every finite range quantum chain. So there's a lot of stuff that is known already. Um, okay, so basically you have that. Now there's something even stronger, which one needs for many, many things, but particular for our results. Um, in 72, Lieb, Robinson, uh, Lieb and Robinson showed that in fact, more than this, uh, it the correlation function is exponentially decaying, not only in space, but in the outside of a whole light cone bounded by some velocity. So everywhere there is exponentially decaying and there is exponentially decaying in space time, even if you evolve in time. But you, know, but you have to evolve in space more than time. <laughs> Some velocity that is large enough, right? If the velocity is too low, then you don't have exponential decay. So in other words, the, this observable, this when you evolve an observable, it kind of grows. It's supported everywhere, but mostly it's supported within some light cone. And beyond that is, is exponentially decaying as a, as a support of observable. It can be made mathematically precise. You know? So this is the situation, so uh, you have a, uh, exponential uh, clustering, uh, and this is true not only on, on this is true also on time of observables and all that. Okay, so you have exponential clustering. Um, okay, there's another result actually that that we need, which was not known before, uh, but which is which is true. I mean, it's interesting by itself. And what it says, it says something about what's happening not outside but inside this light cone. By the way, this light cone is bound by a certain velocity. It's called the Lieberman velocity. And that velocity, well, it depends on the, the details of the model. You, you can write a kind of a, um, a bound for what the velocity can be from the, from the details of the interaction. Um, but but uh, maybe I should say in a typical, you, you take a, a typical spin chain, now that there's a Lieber Benson velocity, typically you're going to have exponential decay in a much wider region that depends on the state. And non exponential decay, maybe just, just along certain direction or maybe in a smaller region, right? So, and determining exactly where you, you have exponential decay is very difficult. Everywhere where you, it's very difficult. All you can say is that, well, at least there, but you surely have beyond, and then de determining that is difficult. But well, what we can say, though, we, within that icon, is that if you do time average of observable, that will go to zero. So maybe, so, so time average of observable within any correlation function. So in particular, two point correlation function, time average will, will go to zero. Okay. So maybe it doesn't decay, but Maybe it's, it's maybe it's just a slate forever or whatever. But if you do time averaging, okay, that would be zero. So this, so it cannot grow and kind of do something weird and crazy. Okay, and that would be true almost everywhere within that light cone. So that means there is something, some kind of a thematization happening, right? When you go in large time, so it's just not large space but large time. So so there is a uh, so in other words that time average observable. If you look at it with respect to the state, the time average observable uh, uh, for time large has uh, has zero variance because it's it's when it's a Cartesian function decays, so it becomes a non-fluctuating observable, and this is some kind of ergodicity, right? Ergodicity tells that time average is equal to ensemble average. So here is we say time average of an observable along array is essentially equal to the average within the state. It has uh, zero, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I is mistaken this, this formula, sorry about that. So what I meant uh, is a limit, 
T inverse integration to the to T and then this observable at some position VT in time T that this in the limit is the state of uh, about not zero, zero, sorry about that. Zero is when you have it within connected caution function is zero. But in general is the state times the identity operator. It converges to the identity operator. Okay. So, so what I meant is connected caution function decay, right? Not, not the observable itself, okay. connected caution function decay. So this is some kind of ergodicity, ergodicity within the light cone. Okay. And that's important to have anything emerging at large time. And this is at the source of, of emergence of early hydrodynamics, actually, this kind of ergodicity. Okay, so, uh, so that's what we know, okay, exponential there and ergodicity there equals to the average within the state. And I write, uh, I write omega because this is the usual notation in, in mathematics, this average of A within the state like that, okay. And from that, we can uh, derive some, something about What's happening in there and earlier hydrodynamics of course is what's happening in there, right? It's not there, but it's in there, it's in large time. Okay. Okay, questions about this. So these are kind of basic results. Right? So no, no. So time continuous, space discrete, because it's quantum chain. So I take here, this is space time, like a space time, right? So I take a kind of a, a floor function to get a yeah. Yeah, space discrete, though, space discrete. Yeah. I mean, this is not essential at all in the whole structure, but it's essential if I want to use uh, known exact results because it's been derived in quantum chains and not in quantum field theory. I mean, quantum field theory, there is stuff, but it's not as, maybe not as strong. And then you have potential divergence at small, at small distances and all that. In quantum chains, you don't have that. So it's a bit simpler somehow. And also you have local degrees of freedom, which is finite. So it's kind of simpler to have the, the discrete space for mathematical purposes. But I don't think it's physically like very fundamental. Yes, the first len, len two. Yes, uh, has yes. Two L plus one. Yes. Ah, yes, yes, indeed, yeah. But it does. Yeah, sorry. This is this is a uh, yeah. It's just a change of uh, L uh, something to L plus one. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 So and this is because I take finite temperature and short range interaction. There's no. It doesn't matter. Odd and even. I mean, it's a good question, right? So how how do I take the limit and the theorem from Araki? Is that well the limit L to infinity exists for you know L you, you don't need to take it like that. So he, he formulates the theorem more, more generally. You can take H, you know, on is you you take H on on any finite domain, fi, finite region, and then you make this finite region bigger and bigger, such that eventually all the spins are covered. Doesn't matter how you take this this finite region bigger, okay? In what way, it doesn't matter. And the, the result exists. So the of course the theorem is formulated better than that. So indeed, it doesn't matter because of the lack of phase transitions. Right? So you have a nice state that is exponentially cl clustering, homogeneous, stationary, that satisfy exponential clustering outside, and that satisfy ergodicity in, inside there. And that, these are the main things of the state. Okay. okay then uh, what we want to do? Uh, uh, we want to study correlation functions. So we we do in a, instead of looking at the precise uh, space-time ray and how things decay and all that. Typically, what one does in hydrodynamics is looking at the k omega plane, actually, right? Fourier transform, like, like we said actually in the morning. In, in so Fourier transform, k omega response function, and all that. So correlation function in 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 Fourier transform is the thing to look at. It's kind of more natural. So I'm going to do Fourier transform in space, but I'm going to do not Fourier transform in time. I, although I could try to formulate things in Fourier transform in time, I just take the time as it. In fact, in order to actually obtain results, I'm going to do averaging over time with one over t over there. So uh, more precisely, so I'm going to look at this caution function. So let me explain that a little bit. So this is a two-point function, two observable, a dagger b at space time point x t. Okay? X is on z, the discrete in chain, and t is real. And uh, I put a, a wave number, which uh, k there, which actually here I put it at uh, k t equals kappa. So k is kappa over t. So k becomes small. Okay, that's the thing. So small k. Uh, um, k equals so small wave number, large wave length, yeah, and large t. So k is kappa over t, and I look at large time. But just instead of just looking at large time, I'm going to do an average over time. And this is just a mathematical kind of a trick to make things to make sure that I can use the ergodicity thing. <laughs> but actually, what I expect, although I cannot prove, I expect that just the large time limit of this thing itself that it exists, the large time limit. And if it exists, well, the average gives the same thing, right? 
but but proving the instance of limits is actually very difficult there and I, I i don't know if the large time limit of this just exists okay in fact i don't even know this is a, the the interesting thing that was blocking me also for a long time i don't even know if this limit exists the average thing i don't even know if it exists i cannot prove that i think for for most system it, it must exist but i'm not even sure it exists but there is a, another mathematical trick that if you have so this maybe it doesn't exist the limit but it's bounded it's a bounded function of t and you can attribute a formal limit to any bounded sequence of bounded functions in such a way that if the limit exists is the usual limit if it doesn't it's just a number you give to that sequence it's called the Banach limit <laughs> sorry yeah uh, so this is a good question i can prove it's bounded and you're not supposed to see that just like that here actually <laughs> it's a it's not too complicated but yeah you have to I, I'm going to define Hilbert space. You have to find some Hilbert space and do some Cauchy Schwartz and all that. Uh, by uh, defining appropriate space and Cauchy Schwartz, you prove it. It's not difficult, but you, should not, you shouldn't. You, one can prove it exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So, but yeah, so one can prove. And for any bounded sequence, there's a back. So, okay. So, you use this mathematical nicety. So, okay. I, physically, I think the limit exists. But if it doesn't, doesn't matter. You, you give me your favorite Banach limit and then. And the result will hold for that one, whatever, right? Okay, so this is the 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 object that one is interested in. See, so okay, uh, so yeah. So now we want to talk about the concept quantities, right? The, I told you about. So what are the concept quantities? So for that, I need to define Hilbert space, and for proving boundedness, everything is is Hilbert spaces that you that you define. So there's, there's a lot of ways of defining Hilbert space in the context of cis algebra. People have constructed Hilbert space of all kinds. So. Here's one way, okay? It's it's uh, it's one way that is perfectly fine, and it is the Hilbert space of susceptibility, actually, which has been considered, in fact, in the literature in different ways. So, so what is this? So I look at Cauchy function and I sum over all of x the connected Cauchy function because it's of exponential decay. This exists, the sum, okay? And I look at that, and this defines for me a sesquilinear form on the space of of finitely supported observable. So fine, you know, finite number of sides spins on finite number of sides. A and B are operators on finite number of sides. I put them in there. A and B. I calculate that. That's a number. And that's my form. Like, a, like, like you learn in, in basic, uh, you know, linear algebra. Of course, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, linear in B, anti-linear in A, and satisfies all nice properties. Okay, so it's not quite an inner product because it may be that it's a zero. I don't know, right? I know it's finite, but maybe zero. So maybe there's some, you know, it's, it's, there's some zero thing. But then I can take away the, this, this null space, all this, the elements that have zero length under this kind of pre inner product. I can take them away, so mod them out, so do, do equivalence classes, right? And the, the result, so, which are any element plus this null space, now this, on that, now this defines a, an inner product from, from the, from the elementary books on, on linear algebra, define inner product. Okay, and then once you have an inner product, you can complete the thing. So you can add what is called the Cauchy sequences, which are sequence of, of equivalence classes like that, which are such that they converge under this, uh, uh, under this norm. So like an minus am, the norm of that, goes to zero when n and m go to infinity. You know, remember the thing, uh, I think I got it. So limit n and m go to infinity, like as double limit, so of a n minus a n must go to, must be equal to zero. So you have a sequence, a n, so that that. So the limit of that sequence is, uh, uh, is a Cauchy sequence and I, add that formally as an element of my space and now I get a Hilbert space. <laughs> so, well, to be honest, I, I, I don't really, I don't, well, right now, I don't care at all what these are, just add them formally and then I can use Hilbert space techniques. Eventually this will actually come back and bite me and I have to take care of that. Okay? But for now it's kind of a formal thing, right? When you have a Hilbert space. Okay. And this is, this is a very similar to something called the gelfin Neimark siegel construction in C algebra that people do that with kind of some construction. Um, so the interpretation is that these, this space is V0, so the space of A's under this inner product, in fact, corresponds to densities of extensive quantities. Why? Because I can add a total derivative to A and I, give, I get the same result. Total derivatives 
by telescopic summation get zero, right? So if I if I add if I look at the derivative, discrete derivative, so a of x plus one minus a of x, okay, and I put it in here, I get zero. I get a dagger of l minus a dagger of minus l when l goes to infinity, and I get zero. Okay, so the derivative are within this null space, and so that means that what I'm looking is every you know element up to derivatives. And these are, you know, when I when I write something like I want sum over x of ax, you know, this is my kind of a total charge of something like that, right? It's a total thing. Well, this is the same thing as sum over x of ax plus derivative of bx, right? Because the derivative gives zero under the summation. So in fact, what I'm looking at are essentially total charge, extensive charges. Okay. So basically, this is what this is supposed to define. So here, the space of extensive charges or Densities of extensive charges. Yeah. Okay. It's a bit, uh, <laughs> sorry for it's a bit heavy, but you need that Hilbert space. And everything follows actually from, from that Hilbert space. Okay. Um, then there's a subspace of conserved quantities. So the idea now is that I can do time evolution on my quantum chain. Uh, question. Yeah. So you see, this is, a, a, that's why I'm trying to kind of, a, a, the, I'm taking a state which is already at infinite size, a state, right? So the, there's no boundary anymore. So I have to define that properly. I define this as an infinite sum. And if you put an infinite sum with a total derivative, you see the derivative disappears because of clustering. So it's different from the, I mean, you, what you have in mind is that I, we define that. In fact, this is, uh, you know, so in, that, that would be A plus, well, B at infinity minus B and minus infinity. And sometimes you know, this is non zero with boundary conditions, right? And this is true, and I want to avoid these sort of things, and I avoid that by considering torsion functions. So you have the thing that correlates and then goes to zero. That thing goes to zero. That's how you avoid these sort of things all the time, and then you can do stuff. So, so it's just you do the, the right construction to avoid this, and then things work. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, you can do time evolution on the quantum chain. It turns out, in fact, this is a theorem you have to prove. You use Lieber Bisson bound that time evolution also acts on this Hilbert space, even adding the Cauchy sequences. Okay, that's, that's important mathematically, fine. You can do time evolution of the whole Hilbert space. And more than that, it is actually a, a unitary operator. And that's because of the, of the homogeneity of the state, right? You, you have tau of a dagger B is the same as a tau minus T of B, because you can just evolve plus or minus T and put it at the other side, okay? So time evolution is a nice operator on that Hilbert space. And then you just define like you say, this is my definition, whatever, okay? The, the conserved quantities are all these elements of the Hilbert space that are invariant on the time evolution, okay? So this is, this is kind of the main definition, the, the basic thing, and that is what is supposed to be kind of the, the you know, de describing the Boltzmann-Gibbs principle and all of that. Now I have a definition though, right? There is no ambiguity whatsoever. It's complicated to, to work out, but there's no ambiguity, right? You have a Hilbert space, well-defined, and you have, you know, this is my, these are my conserved quantities and that's it. So you give me a quantum chain in principle, if I'm really clever enough, I can calculate that space. But you see now that if I want to have all the conserved quantities, I will have to consider the Cauchy sequences, right? So there may be some hidden stuff like you, a weird Cauchy sequence that is conserved and you hadn't seen it in, in your original model, right? So this is the, the, the detail. So that's why it, it can be complicated, but this is this. Okay. So certainly anything that satisfies the continuity equation leads to a conserved quantity according to the definition that's easy to show, okay? And, um, okay. Uh, so there was, I'm not sure if I want to go into that, I won't say too much, but maybe there was some quasi-local conserved quantities constructed in integrable models by E.S. Kim Prozen, which are conserved quantities whose density is not supported on finite number of sides, but infinitely many with exponentially decaying kind of envelope, okay? They, People have constructed that they're important in GGEs, they're, they're super important in, in all the, the generalized hydro and all that stuff. And it turns out that they are part of, of this construction. In fact, the way that these cost of quantities are kind of defined is by saying that you look at a, a, a series a sequence of observable operator whose square of, you know, of um, if you look at the, the connected coefficient function of the square of that thing, it should not grow more than L. Okay? Turns out there's a bijection between this A0 that I've constructed and that the set of such stuff. Okay, one can prove. 
So what I want to say is that you know what people have considered before it actually is the same as this Hilbert space that I've that I've defined here. Okay. So, so uh, I wanted to give an example of a free model. You can show I haven't finished the whole thing, but that these a dagger a like in the XX chain actually are part of that space as it should be, right? I mean, otherwise I would have problems, right? So these are the number of operators, the, the operator that count number of modes, the free feminine modes at theta and all that. You can show that you know this is part of that space, and you know you define them for any function f, and that space becomes just an L2 space on these functions. It's very simple. Right? L2 space with, with, some, with some measure, which is that measure. So you can kind of work out the example, and then it goes back to what you would ex expect. Right? Which is then you, you do both the guess principle, that's the object that you want to consider. And so uh, now in this object, there is uh, some local observables here. right? This is not uh, the inner product in that Hilbert space. Right? The, the inner product was just sum over all x, no time evolution. right? But here I do I do uh, time evolution and I also do if die kx over t there right so I modify it. Well, you can it turns out that actually this is this as a as a function of a and b is actually defined on the Hilbert space. So you can extend that by putting a Cauchy sequence and the result exists and it's bounded on Hilbert space. So this is well defined on that space of constant quantities, which is not necessarily obvious now because now I take a non-zero uh, wave number. Although a small wave number, but not zero wave number anyway. Okay, well, the, the previous definition of the Hilbert space, right, was was you just integrate over all over all sorry, come there over all x, that is, and then this you know, and then you look at elements a that that are finite over all that you complete. Now this is that one. Now I put in e to i k x, right? So it's different. Well, it turns out it's still okay. So the the result still well defined in that Hilbert space. And the main result okay, is this. <laughs> so it looks very simple, right? It's small. But this is it. So S A B at kappa is the same thing as S projection over this space of concept charge of A and projection of B in the space of concept charge. So this is the projection mechanism. So you don't need to evaluate all this S A B. All you need to evaluate is the S on these concept quantities that I've defined formally. So that can be this is a smaller space, and there's a projection mechanism, and this projection is well defined in terms of Hilbert space. It's an autonomous projection. So that so this is the result of the Boltzmann Gibbs, like in mathematics, kind of. But it's the same as uh, so it's, sorry, it's the same it's the same as this, right? You have that, but now I have to define this properly with i k x k x over t and all that stuff, okay? And projection, well, it's a projection in terms of Hilbert space that I have to define properly. So Hilbert space and it's subspace of things that are invariant on the time evolution, right? And uh, yeah, and I can write explicitly in terms of basis. These are matrices I had introduced in my lecture. So the, the susceptibility matrix of concept quantities is inverse with the CIG on top. And then the projection is explicitly a sum over all kind of ba basis, uh, over a basis of the space of concept quantity. Right? And you know, because of the finite dimensional uh, uh, kind of local space, you know, there's a there's a countable basis. I don't know what the basis, is, but there exists one for sure. Okay? And so you can write it in, as a sum over basis element. And then you have this is a formula that people have written before, uh, or similar formula in context of uh, hydrodynamics. But now it's a, you know with a precisely defined inner product and Hilbert space of constant quantity. Okay? Yeah. But this is the Boltzmann Gibbs principle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. So yeah. So, so this this is proven. Yeah, this is proven. Now, what is what I didn't tell you is what are these QI. So what I'm saying is that there, there must exist a countable basis of the space uh, of the space Q zero, and then QI are defined as this basis. I don't know what the basis is though. So this is this that can be just rewritten by using basis of Hilbert space in that form. And you know that this is an infinite dimensional matrix that is invertible, that is positive, and where these sums may be infinity, but it may be infinite series, but they all converge by because it's just a basis expansion in the Hilbert space. The result is finite. And it, it could the, the, the matrix can could be finite or could be infinite dimensional. I don't know. Yeah. So in integrable system, this is an infinite dimensional matrix because you do have an infinity of of quantities and they are all part of this Hilbert space. The yes. So in typical system, you would accept, expect, so what I would expect, I mean, my naive expectation, it's actually may be wrong, 
that in typical chaotic system, the space A0, this space Q0, Q0 is one dimensional <laughs> and contains only the energy. You expect that, right? So, so in this sense, the projection, there's no sum. There's just one thing to project on V. It is the energy. So it's kind of a strong statement, right? Now, but, but I don't know how to prove that I don't need the energy actually. And now recently I've thought about that and I'm not even sure anymore. Maybe there's more, I'm not too sure. You know, it's not, it's hard to prove that there is no other conserved charges, right? It's, uh, it's uh, yeah. I mean, this is, but this is a very important open problem. There are proofs in the XYZ model with magnetic field that there are no local conserved charges. This is, this is a recent proof, but there's, that does not prove that there are no uh, Cauchy sequences of conserved charges, quasi local, pseudo local, and all that. And they are part of the space, you know, provably. And so you would have to show that there are no quasi local. But you would expect this sum to be typically just there's a single term. <laughs> okay, so, and then the linear is the low equation. Uh, maybe I just say so, okay. Uh, well, one, one thing that one can prove is that if you have uh, any, any, observ any local observable Q, whose derivative is a conserved quantity, whose derivative gives zero under that, that uh, Hilbert space with respect to time, must satisfy a continuity equation. So there must exist a current. It's like a kind of an author theorem model, but a, a small version of an author theorem in for quantum chain. So if you have a conserved quantity, there must be a continuity equation for it. Okay. And, uh, and then, once you have that, well, you, then you have to do a bit more. You use a projection and all this, and you can prove the Fourier transform version of the linearized Euler equation. So the linearized equation in Fourier space and Fourier space for the, for the for, you know, in a space of, as function of the, the kappa, so the wave number. In fact, you can show that this function is differentiable in kappa, which is non trivial, and that it is given in a basic expansion as a sum over j with some matrix aij, which Kind of takes that form with in, involving the inner product of the current, which you know must exist by the continuity equation, and all the densities in the basis and this inverse C matrix. Okay. So this is the linearized equation in complete general form, and not in a form that is practical in any way, because you have to know what is the basis, you have to know all the consequences and all that, but but you know that the, that Fourier space uh, two-point function is differentiable. And satisfies a linear equation, you know, in terms of kappa, which is like in terms of x and t. Okay, so which is kind of non-trivial. Okay, and uh, yeah, if you have uh, just the energy which is conserved, and you are in a thermal state, then the the energy current is zero in a thermal state, right? So this a actually is zero, and so what you would get is dd kappa of s energy energy is zero. So you get a very you get something equal to zero, so it's, some, it's very simple. In fact, you, you expect that uh, if, you just, if you don't have, you, this is a trivial Euler equation. Okay? So you expect that in this case. But, uh, but, you know, but it's hard to prove that it's a single conserved quantity. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it depends. You see, if, if, you have, if you have one conserved charge, then you have to know is this matrix zero or not, right? So, so I mean, if, if you're in a thermal state, the heat mode has zero velocity. So the, the velocity is the spectrum of the matrix. The matrix is zero. And so you find DD kappa S is zero. If you are not, if you are say with, with motion, then yeah, so DD kappa S is velocity times S. And, and yeah, then you can solve that, right? It's the K kappa, kappa times V. You have explicit function. Indeed, so this is kind of a powerful result. This other kind of dynamics is, is powerful. But, uh, but of course, what is difficult here is determining that you have just one mode, right? And all that, this is the, the difficulty. Okay, so these are, these are the questions that's, uh, so I agree with that. Okay, so that's what I can say. Conclusion, I think uh, that's it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's, okay, set of constant quantities of ballistic waves is well defined in principle mathematically, but hard to work out physically, so, but in principle could be done. Uh, the linear is equation are shown in every short range quantum chain. So I don't know, so you, you judge if the result is, is kind of a, Vacuous or not, <laughs> it's not going to be vacuous, but of course, it's not the panacea, it's not everything. Uh, so, everything, all the quasi local charges have been constructed in integral models, they are part of that space that, that one can show. But maybe there are more, it's always a question of are there more? It's more difficult. 
uh, yeah, so determining the structure of Q0 and, you know, is it finite dimensional in non uncable systems? And then one would like to go beyond uh, just the linearized Euler equation and really do the actual Euler equation. And that should be possible. It should be accessible. But now you need to have not just a, sphing, a single state, but states that change in space time, right? So it's more difficult. So you have to define them appropriately. And the, the general idea here is that these concept quantity, the Hilbert space, Q0, is actually a, a tangent space for a manifold of state. That's the mathematical idea, let's say. But this manifold of state could be a fifth dimensional manifold, so these are hard to work with and, and all that. But I mean, people have worked out infinite dimensional manifold with tangent space, which are Hilbert space. There's this kind of, there's some geometry, there's some Riemann geometry with, with that. So supposedly that's, that's the structure that we would have, but okay, not yet done. And uh, that's, what, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, merci Benjamin. So the talk is open to questions. Question Except there. Gilles. <laughs> <laughs> Except Gilles. No. Uh, okay, so Gilles, uh, is there anyone on Zoom? Do we need this mic? <laughs> There's some people on Zoom, yeah. I think, okay. okay. Really so here, we'll use it again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry for the question. But if, yeah. yeah, no. I think uh, so mm -hmm. actually, I have two questions, but I think you partly addressed them also. So just to make sure actually I understand maybe more. So is it true that... Uh, did I understand correctly that if you, now you want to do inhomogeneous systems, yeah. then you have to do the full Euler equation and the homogeneity uh, hypothesis was useful to derive this linearized. Yeah, yeah, correct. Indeed, indeed, yeah. correct. So it was, it was essential in fact in the derivation. So you would hope to have uh, like almost homogeneity to be able to assume homogeneity on large scale, if not on the whole state, which is what where Euler had or should hold. And then that, that would be sufficient somehow to, to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, my second question, if I may, so would we agree that if we have one system with one constant charge and one with infinitely many, they would have a different uh, hydrodynamic? Yes. And apparently it's a very hard question, but in my I don't know, understanding or what I learned in my thesis is that integrability is actually very fine tuned. And yes. that if you kind of, it's easily broken. Yes. Mm -hmm. So would that mean that if you have an integrable Hamiltonian and then you just had a very small perturbation we did have a completely different hydrodynamic yes correct yes correct indeed okay. indeed so of course in in reality you know you people have checked hydrodynamics of integrable systems in experiments in experiments they they are not quite as integrable in cold atomic gases so in reality you know earlier hydro happened at very large scales in space time and here I'm taking the exact mathematical limit so in the exact mathematical limit, yeah, it would change suddenly everything. But uh, in reality, because you don't take that much large time and all that, even if, you, if you're near to integrable, the nearly conserved quantities still are important for the large time dynamics. So there's a scale. And it's actually this, the scale, you know, is, is you can really see that in experiment. I mean, you have near integrability, but near enough so that the all experimental scales, you see the early hydro of integrable systems. Okay, so it's mathematically, mathematically very fine tuned, but yes. physically actually near integrable, it's enough to. Yeah, in fact, okay. in fact, one D system are, are very kind of very likely to be integrable from an experimental point of view, <laughs> because as yeah, I mean, if your interaction is near enough to integrability, or if you have low enough density so that you just have two body scattering, so the physics of integrability actually is is uh, is really not far. It's really not far in many cases. But uh, mathematically, yeah, so, so this, the, these Hilbert space, you know, Q0 is, is it should, it should be possible, for instance, to prove mathematically that for almost all uh, short range Hamiltonian on, on five sides, for instance, then Q0 is, is fine dimensional, something like that, right? That almost all of them are just not integrable. And that, that is probably accessible, you know, mathematically. It's like, it's, it's very unlikely that Q is in fifth dimensional. It's very, Tight adjustment, special adjustment of, of, of everything. Okay, well, do you believe the proof? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only uh, real math person. <laughs> Uh, you worked with the uh, thermal states, if I understand. Yes, correctly. yes, yes. So, how close can you get to t for zero? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah. So, I think I'm not completely sure, but um, I think if if you have a gap system, uh, that everything works. I don't think I think that's fine because all you need is decaying correlation mm -hmm. in space. 
So whatever the state is, if you have that, it should be fine. If, uh, of course, if it's not exponentially decaying, then everything fails, or actually, I'm not sure how much fails. <laughs> I'm, I'm not completely sure how much fails, actually. Maybe, maybe quite a bit still is true, or I'm not completely sure. Like, yeah, the differentiability of S of kappa actually probably fails. I think I, I need it quite a lot there. So, and then how near can you get? Well, you should mathematically, as near as you want, it doesn't matter, right? You, epsilon, whatever small you want. It's just T0 that is not. Yes, because, because that take, again, it's a matter of scale. If I'm very, very near to, well, actually, at experimentally available scale, it will fail. Maybe if it fails, it will be something different. But then a very large scale, you will just see the exponential decay will be OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is the scale? Uh, yeah, that can be determined by you know, the inverse gap you know, time scale and all that. Yeah, I, I had a question uh, actually playing on, on that. And yeah. uh, also uh, about the, the original Hamiltonian you wrote down for the spin chains, which has the Heisenberg spin yes, rotation yes, yes. symmetry. So what is the role that 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 is u2 symmetry yes, u2 symmetry yeah i mean here is, this is a good question in fact this is a so i didn't talk about the symmetry at all right there yeah. but actually they do play around. i mean symmetries of course give conserved quantities so 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 what is interesting here i you see i defined the q0 space the space of conserved quantities purely as a hilbert space but uh, conserved quantities they are they usually have an algebraic structure like a su2 right mm -hmm. so there's some structure into it so i don't need i don't need any of that structure uh, but I need to consider all the conserved quantities. So here it looks like, you know, there's a C2 symmetry where I need to consider all these conserved quantities, even if they don't commute, they've got to be put in, like, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a basis, the sigma x marks, so they are independent, linearly independent, even if they don't commute. So, so you know, non-abelian or whatever, it doesn't matter. So I, I just need to take into account all conserved quantities and commuting or not, does not matter. So, so the the the, the structure, the algebraic structure, is not important in in, the, in this construction. It, it just should be conserved quantities. So, come with the Hamiltonian, and that's it. Yeah, I see. I mean, which which brings me to this zero temperature question, because if you had a yeah had an U one symmetry rather than mm -hmm. SU two, you will have things such as vortices at zero temperature, yes. which would be stable defects. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, so, but this presumably, is, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this this is in, this is at zero temperature. I mean. So I, you see, th this is the, the, the trivial part of, of all the physics. At zero temperature, you have then much more non-trivial part, and then that will play a role. And, and uh, so that is probably not captured within. It's not captured at all. That, that's why you know you have you know you have to have these states have these and these properties. And the state you're talking about with these twists and all that, I mean, they don't have these properties. I see. These properties, and then you have to study that. So yeah, of course. I mean, but this is interesting, and it would be interesting indeed to. Yeah, to go further and introduce the actual algebraic structure of these conserved quantities, yeah. which will play a role then. Okay, so, so one more question this is probably slightly stupid. You, you obviously start with these thermal correlators, right? Yes, this yes. very gives uh, trace formula. Uh, so is, the, I mean, is there a reason that you consider that to be true or something that, that, to, that you can work with? It's just you mean that it is like physically relevant set of yeah. I mean, or... why do you choose that correlator? I mean, as a mathematician, as a physicist, we, that's what we do. Yeah. But as a mathematician, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really know. just, just I guess because I'm a physicist and maybe <laughs> that's why I think it's relevant. But there's no real reason. Uh, so for for the construction exam, I mean, the the, the, the main point here why you have uh, early hydro is the the decay of correlations. That's that's the thing, right? Which, which means like physically, you know, the, no phase transitions and all that stuff, right? So decay of correlations, strong enough decay. So if I that see. was not precise, now you can be more precise now that, but uh, like exponential decay is strong enough, okay? So then, and then mathematically, that's why you, you take these states, they are fine. But whatever state, you know, define a, a function or a linear map, which is a phase time transition variant and, and decay, that's it, that's sufficient. And you give me one and I'm happy with it. You know? <laughs> Yeah, so, but, so it can be a non-equilibrium steady state as well. Yeah, if it has strong enough decay, right? It can be a non-equilibrium steady state. It could be some some weird state coming from somewhere else. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, and sometimes I mean there there have been uh, some work in our community looking at some correlators which are not really thermal correlators. These yes. are different kind of correlators which yeah. capture different phenomena. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Even yeah. across which could be different phases of matter. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Something which are yeah. out of time ordering. 
Yes, yeah, uh, okay. Nobody. So I was wondering whether there's an interest in, in those yeah. kind of correlators and, and their methods. Certainly, yeah, certainly. I mean, this is just the, the naive example, right? That, that I say. And it, it, the, the theory that I'm using there is developed in the 70s and 80s, the sister algebra and people were studying these states. I see. That's kind of a thing. And then there's not so many people studying the sister algebra formation anymore. So now this kind of stopped there a little bit. So it's, a, it's got to be renewed a bit, I would say. So um, yeah, so this will be interesting for sure. Well, I think we asked enough questions for Benjamin. We can always discuss later on. So let's thank you again, Benjamin.